Uh, my name is Tian Wei. I'm a moderator and host of China Global Television Network, but that's not important. What is important is we are here to talk about our future together. So it's my great honor to introduce to all of you our four distinguished panelists on the stage. From the very left, my great friend Nadia Huta Galang, Goodwill Ambassador from the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, based in Geneva. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Marcel Smith, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Asia Pacific Head from the Corporate Strategy of Cargill. Thank you, sir. From the industry, certainly we want to welcome right. you. Of course, we have our producer of this beautiful story, Dimitri de Vries, who, uh, sorry, Keith Scully, who, of course, is the director of Silverback Films, with uh, uh, also a cultural leader of the World Economic Forum, last but certainly not least. Dimitri de Vries, a member of the managing board of Royal DSM from the Netherlands. We're coming from all over. But we all watch this story. If I can, may I ask the two gentlemen who have not talked yet so far to give us some of the takeaways that they have, particularly from an industry perspective. Yeah, thank, Dimitri? Thank, thank you very much. Um, I was afraid that Keith will bring me into depression with all these these, these movie clips, but uh, the good thing is that he ended with a positive note and that there's still hope. And uh, I think it's also too late to be pessimistic. Um, and I'm, I'm an optimist and I represent, indeed, as you said, the industrial companies. And, and Royal DSM stands for, um, in the past, for Dutch state mines. Um, we were a coal mining company, so basically we were in the, in the beginning in destroying our planet, almost, right? Um, and we've transformed ourselves because of optimistic hope. And, and what the message is from this fantastic movie Netflix series is that we need to take responsibility. And I think Keith clearly explained that there is a very delicate balance. And that balance will continue to destroy itself because we are out of balance. And we need to take action. Mm. And we feel that we should take the responsibility <coughs> in thinking differently from a business perspective. We think that this balance should be people, planet, and profit. And I think that could go hand in hand, and maybe that should transform into that should go hand in hand. All right. But if you look at the audience today, earlier when we were watching the movie, it's a full house. Now when we're talking about solutions, I'm afraid that we only have half of the house. Of course, people have different commitments. That certainly is understandable at the World Economic Forum. But this is the issue here, that we do get alarmed, but when it comes to real actions, there could be a problem. So what about that, Marcel? Um, I, I actually think it's OK that we have half an house. house. <laughs> um, the, Good what, to see Mrs. Schraub still yeah, sitting here with us. What's, what's happening in the, in the food industry is at the end of agricultural supply chains, mm. you see consumers becoming enormously engaged around the subject of provenance and integrity of the supply chain. Mm. Um, and that is happening in all countries around the world. People worry about food safety, they worry about where their food comes from, they worry about antibiotics and what that's doing to the uh, biodiversity. They're worrying about all these subjects and they are putting pressure on the supply chain as it integrates back all the way to the source. Mm. Uh, I like the movie a lot because what it does, it actually generates awareness with a target audience that um, creates that consumer pressure. Mm. So I'm not too fussed about the fact that people have left a room. They've left a room, they think something has to change and hopefully that changes their buying behavior. And if that changes their buying behavior, then um, everybody in the supply chain will have to react to it and, and that will happen. The other thing that I quite liked is the, um, the optimistic note. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very important that we all realize that things can get solved and can get done. Um, what was just said is there is people, planet, and profit. 
I think there is also something to be said for businesses are coming to realize yeah. that attending the needs of consumers in respect of getting assurance around the integrity of the supply chain is a business opportunity. It's not just the right thing to do, but it is also a business opportunity. And if that spreads, right. then we will find solutions relatively quickly. Well said. Keith, as someone who's been doing productions about nature, mm. I'm sure you've been hearing the wow, oh, very often when people watch your mm. works. How to still remain optimistic at a time when you repeatedly have to find the similar stories and tell them in a way that many people will still go with, wow, oh, oh my God. Well, 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 Keep on with that strength. Now, what makes me really optimistic is, and even in this year, you are seeing the changes you've talked about. Mm. We are finally seeing a shift um, in how people consume. You're finally seeing governments taking this issue seriously. It, even when we started making this series, I talk about a number of these issues four years ago, um, and in, I'd be laughed out of court. Now everyone is on the same page, and mm. we're moving very, very quickly. My worry is we have got so little time. Because if you actually listen to the, the hard scientific data, the stuff that they don't really want to yeah. publish, yeah. Um, that's when you really realize that actually we're in a race against time. If we can win that race, we absolutely can do it. We absolutely know what to do. That's the thing. Uh, the scientists have worked it out. We have loads of the s solutions. There are all sorts of good ways forward. Mm. It's just that speed of transition. But the speed uh, is crucial, I have the, to the, say. The speed is everything now. And, um, you know, when I hear our government, for example, uh, in Britain says we're going to go carbon neutral by 2050, I think that's fantastic that they mm. made the statement, but could it at least have been 2030? Your experience uh, probably is very similar to Nadia, who has been doing the Goodwill Ambassador job for UNEP for a long time, and certainly on the advocacy for 20 years, if I heard it right, the other day when we were talking to one another. What about this long stretch of time vis-a-vis uh, -vis the urgency that has been beautifully demonstrated in this movie? Uh, oh, did I hear a long sigh? I yeah. did. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it has been, a, it, it, it was a very lonely space to be talking about these things. And I mentioned earlier, it was kind of like the crazy lady sitting in the corner. But um, there is a lot more noise now. And I think uh, it is critical. Uh, and we need to act, um, as Greta says, like our house is on fire. Um, how many people in the room are parents? Yeah, yeah. OK, so maybe half. OK, and then so what are you going to do about it? What are you doing about what you've just seen on the screen? It's our responsibility as human beings, not only as human beings, but especially if you are a parent, to do everything that you can to make whatever changes you can in, our, you know, in the world that your children are going to, uh, are already growing up in and in interfacing with incredible challenges. Um, so it, it has to happen immediately in whatever capacity you work. Uh, you can influence and, and make choices that have knock-on effects and that are beneficial for the community and, oh, and the planet. It's the human nature about only crying over the spilled milk. Yeah, I think that is the key issue. I think there is an interesting psychological test of, of children who basically get a piece of candy and that they are offered a second piece of candy if they can wait for two hours. More than 60% of the kids take the one piece of candy. I see. So we, we are short-sighted as a human being. Uh, and that is basically the risk. Because we're like a, a boiling frog in, in, in close to be boiled water. Mm. And then we die, right? So I'm, I'm with Keith here. I think the wake-up call, the sense of urgency is slowly building up. Remember, we agreed on the COP21 agreement, mm. right? But we're lacking completely behind on actionability. So I think this movie is a sense of urgency, is an urgent call, not only to governments, but also to producers, but all, like you said, also to consumers. Mm. And all three need to go hand in hand to, to accelerate that change. Otherwise, we are dead in the water. Let's ask our producer of this wonderful film. 
Keith, what do you think? Who or which party is likely to be the leading factor for this round for the change when you are trying to do this beautiful production with David? What, which, which group? What, the, Meaning, the, whether the, it's the business, the, the consumer, the business, or the consumer, or, or, or the politicians, or international organizations, okay. or international platforms like the World Trade Organization. I, which one? Well, I, this round, at least. I, I think you can do nothing if you haven't got business on your side. Okay. A, lot of, a lot of conservationists and people, environmentalists, have always seen business as the enemy. I don't come from that place mm. at, 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 at all. I embrace the partnership with business, because that's the only way we're, we're going to get it done. Politicians and governments follow people and business. So let's, let's, let's sort that out. You have to build the trust with the audience. Um, you have to build a partnership with business. And if all that happens, governments will follow. I do honestly, though, believe that government needs to take its responsibility. Because like in the case of the whales, if you look at what some simple intergovernment global deals can do very, very quickly, mm. we're all saying about time, but you can cut these deals in an away day. You really can. You can impart a ban on something. You can come to an agreement to control something. So, you know, it is all three. But at the center of it, business. Mm. Marcel, Keith well, I, is saying it's all your business. No, I would, I would I agree. Um, consumers' business. Uh, I think governments generally are a reflection of what voters and populations want, and that's why I think the movie is is so important because it creates general awareness and therefore creates pressure on politicians and and governments. Mm. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, business and consumers are already doing a lot. Mm. Let me give you one example. Okay. Our cocoa and chocolate business um, sells cocoa and chocolate products under a sustainability certificate. And there's a whole system underneath it that tracks um, the origin of the cocoa from Ivory Coast in Ghana with handheld lasers or handheld devices all the way to the chocolate bar that is sold in a store. Five years ago, about 5% of our business was sustainably sourced. Now, that is 50%, mm -hmm. we reckon that in three, four years, that's going to be 80%. So the speed with which the industry is changing and rising to the challenges is enormous. Mm. Um, that's the cocoa and chocolate story. In the palm industry, uh, I think it's very good that you showed the example of the, the forest and the palm. The business community has made enormous progress in terms of making this palm industry more sustainable, and the same is going on in the soy industry. So. Um, it's happening, it's happening really fast. And those consumers that don't understand it yet, please watch the Netflix movie because I think it'll, it'll get everybody saying, yep, we, we got to chime in. It's an issue yeah. crisis. But yeah. what about that timetable Marcel has been talking about? Is that the timetable that you have when it comes to the urgency? I mean, this is a gradual process and your company has been taking a lead in that regard, but still, it is a timing issue. Yeah, I, I mean, it is. I, I, I think the most urgent issue is, is about CO2. I mean, I think that the, really is the, the, the ticking time bomb. And mm. I think we're really seeing that. And obviously, that's a, that's a huge, huge issue to kind of tackle. But I think as the science is coming through, we're, we're seeing that we've already run out of time on, 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 on it. So, um, but I think the other... Um, it's food, they, we've probably got a little bit more time there, but I, I think with, with, with the carbon issue, I, I think it's caught us from behind. Yeah, I, I would like to build on that, uh, mentioning that, that CO2 is the main issue. Remember that most of the waste has almost no price. Mm. So people can just emit CO2 yeah. without being, paying any cost to it. So, a first step, slowly but surely, also in today's world, we're, we're pricing CO2. So if you emit CO2, you have to pay for it. Mm. I'm not saying that it's good to emit CO2, but at least you put an incentive in. Mm. In Europe today, the CO2 price is already 25 euros per ton. We're building up globally. It's a first start because we're spoiling the world because in our economic system is out of balance because you can waste stuff without having even paid for it. And that is creating 
an imbalance which we need to correct. And carbon pricing is one of them. We need more, but a carbon price of around 40 to 50 euros a ton or dollars a ton is changing that system. Scientists have looked at it. And interesting is, two years ago in Davos, there was a, a sort of a, a opinion poll about business leaders. And they said a $50 a ton carbon price for us is changing that system. Mm -hmm. So we are advocating for a carbon price of at least $50 a ton, mm -hmm. just to incur that change. Of and, course, that's and, your... But, but just to add to that, you, you, you then think that if, if, say, you have a national park that is absorbing carbon and that money comes to you, you don't have to get tourists to go to that national park anymore to keep it. It's suddenly generating a revenue just by doing that service. That changes everything, everything. We have to stop this idea of wilderness just being there for tourists. They have to be paid for providing the service. And we, you know, the quicker we do that, and then once you change that dynamic, boom, stuff happens. I think there's a common theme here talking about the demand side and the consumer side and the power of the purse, the, the, the consumer. Um, and it does need to be a multi-pronged approach. Of course, business needs to move, but business moves when the consumers are choosing with their wallet. Um, and so that is sometimes it's underestimated the power of that, but we really as consumers need to be educated, know who to purchase from, and those companies will have to change their practices because they know that you're going to somewhere else to buy products that are more sustainable or have better sourcing uh, 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 um, avenues of sourcing. So, um, and also with the carbon uh, emissions and carbon offsets, I think yeah. uh, another thing that consumers can do is push for airlines to include in their booking flow the simple a box to tick, like some airlines do, but not many do, uh, for carbon, uh, carbon offsets, which don't cost you much as the consumer. And, and push for those offsets to be nature-based uh, uh, carbon offsets, like Keith was saying, is we can sink that money and those offsets into habitats, wetlands, uh, and peat areas uh, to increase biodiversity, which uh, is the ultimate carbon store. Well, but building what, what you just said, if you put a carbon price of fifty dollars a ton in an airline ticket, it will go up tremendously. I have to remind all of so, our sorry. panelists uh, once again that carbon price is only one of those solutions that we have been thinking about for a long time. There are also many other solutions we can also discuss and present to everyone who everyone already knows. So the question really is not about lack of solutions, but rather what to do with these solutions, whether we could unite ourselves with some of these solutions. So what would be the one that could really unite ourselves? We see the debates at the climate change issue, even whether it is an issue or not is being debated now. So we are not taking two steps forward. We are taking one step forward and three steps back, I have to say. as a uh, host of the program, I shouldn't say opinions, but I do have that opinions, and I have to say it here out loud, because it's just a matter of fact. So that is the issue that we are looking at. Let's not hide from the real issue. The real issue is we know what's going to happen, but people still close their eyes and say, well, it's not my business, at least not for two years, not for four years. Mm -hmm. Dimitri. Oh. That is the dark scenario, <laughs> which is partly true. I think, I think it's true, partly true. You also have a more brighter scenario, and I think we've explained a few examples here. I think um, in that sense, we have developed products. I think Cargill just mentioned a few. We at DSM have developed a few products which we're learning from nature. I'll give you a, a quick example. We've learned from nature that if you put enzymes into corn stoves, you can make biofuels. Yes. 70% of corn is just waste. And by using enzymatic processes, which are copied from nature, you can reuse the waste, like nature is doing anyway. It, it's, it's, it's a waste. There's no waste in this whole planet. It's being used and reused. We call that circular economy. It's a buzzword, but it does work. Mm. And 9% of what we currently produce is circular. It means 91% is linear, is wasted. And 9% needs to go up to 99%. Right, a lot of math going on over there, but the question really is, Nadia, you've been doing this. You know it, that when governments make their policy choices, there are priorities. 
what the priorities are exactly what we are having as the theme of our discussion, it's a big question mark. So how are we going to make sure, both from the business perspective and from advocacy's perspective, that priority will be about climate, will be about environment, and will be about the future, as you just said, that how many parents are there in the audience, the future of the next generation. What about setting that priority? How to make sure that priority is done? from the advocacy's perspective? Uh, you know, it, it really is about the power of the people coming together with one, one united voice, mm. I feel. Um, uh, so you talk about the grassroots movement? Uh, the grassroots movements, yeah, and, and yeah, grassroots movements, and really people coming together. Like, for example, uh, in, in the previous uh, session, I was talking about Greta, the young girl from Sweden, who uh, is, uh, is really one of the, the leading climate activists, and she's the one who's right. been uh, uh, the, the one um, pushing for the climate strikes among the young generation. She talked about how uh, she brought up flight shaming. So it's no longer plastic bags and straws, it's, it's flights. And in Sweden now they've experienced a 10% drop in, in airline yeah. uh, tickets uh, in six months. And that is spreading across Europe. And then of course the airlines are afraid now and that's starting to, that it's going to spread across the world. So it is through the consumer and the activist that business has to shift. And also we can do the same with, po with policy as well. If there's enough people who come together with a united voice, find those people, come together with, with a united voice, mm. have a very clear and cohesive message. And those numbers, uh, for example, a movement called Earth Hour. Uh, many people know Earth Hour as right. the campaign that you switch off the lights for an hour and it's like, okay, big deal, so what? Everyone can come together and turn off the lights. But actually, Earth Hour did create a movement where it allowed people to just simply vote and they would get a million votes or two million votes and that would actually sway governments to have to change policy. Mm. So if we can have more of these kinds of initiatives uh, that are, are, are brought together by people who are uh, savvy and have uh, a multidisciplinary background uh, in policy, legal, marketing, yeah. uh, being able to tell stories, then you have, you're able to create power. And maybe if they can have single focuses for each of their outcomes, uh, they'd be more successful. The power of stories. Also this time, World Economic Forum invited an uh, Indonesian girl uh, talking about bye-bye plastic bags. Certainly that's also a grassroots movement, They're talking about throw away the plastics that has been wasting. But from an industry perspective, once again, uh, how to make sure this will be the priority on also the government's policy list? Well, I, I um, would want to call out one thing that I think is highly relevant. Um, Many American companies, of course, have subscribed to the uh, Paris Agreement goals. Uh, Cargill is one of those companies. Yes. Uh, and what you learn if you subscribe to the Paris Agreement goals, and that's no longer a policy issue because you know, that's entirely voluntary, mm -hmm. um, what you learn is um, you actually take the company on a learning curve. Because Interesting. Do, Tell us more about that. Well, what you do is you say, okay, we're, we're going to have to reduce carbon emissions by 10%. Uh, the first thing that you then have to do is you have to start doing all the math in terms of understanding what your carbon emissions Jim are. Jimmy was doing that? Yes, and the Europeans are in a different um, environment. In Europe, 50% of public companies have now pay-related targets that are linked to environmental goals. Mm -hmm. That's not the case in the United States. In the United States, you see lots of American companies voluntarily adopt the Paris Agreement uh, goals. We are one of those companies. We initially did the math and said, okay, if we want to reach those goals, this is about the amount of money that we have to invest for which we don't have an immediate business case. Mm -hmm. Right, let's take that to our shareholders. And then what happens? Then you get on the learning curve. And half a year later, you say, well, but actually, there is a smarter way of doing this. And a year later, you say, no, no, there's an even smarter way of doing this. Mm -hmm. So organizations get onto that learning curve of increased sophistication. Um, and you have to be willing to make some commitments before you have all the solutions. And one more thing that I would say is you have to ask yourself, why is it that so many American companies are making these commitments? Mm -hmm. um, well, they do that because they understand that if they don't take these issues serious, they're going to lose out in the talent market. Um, we are, as an organization, fortunate that we have a lot of initiatives in this space, and it is one of the prime reasons why people join us. 
So uh, let's be realistic in terms of business motives. This is uh, a survival issue. This is about wanting to do the, the right thing, uh -huh. but it is also good business and it is the way of staying in business. What you're saying, Marcel, very interesting because you're suggesting let's set the aspiration first and then we see what we can do, what we can learn along the process. Dimitri, is that the best way? Uh, of course, you're coming from the United States, maybe for the Europeans, is it a big, uh, another story? Well, I, think, I think we share the same approach mm. also in Europe. What I would like to add to it is that it also starts with taking responsibility and being extremely transparent. Mm -hmm. Not only on the financial profit and loss, because we have all types of rules. Yeah. We have US GAAP, IFRS, but there's hardly any rule on how to present what you do for the planet mm. or what is at the cost of the planet. You need to report that. And we do that via emissions, but maybe there's also value to it. Keith was saying the ocean has a certain value. So if you take from the ocean, you need to report as such. So we, we try to convince the community, governments, shareholders, employees, consumers, to go what we call for a holistic P&L which captures people, planet, and profit. Because then it shows what you do as a company who takes responsibility for being part of society at large. Mm. Is the CSR part <coughs> gonna work? Or setting a specific goal, like China always do, every five years, you got a plan over there. That would work. Aspiration, in what way? Keys to you, as a producer of this film. Um. I, I mean, I was just thinking about this whole debate slightly dif 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 differently. But Go I, ahead but I, and tell us about the way you look because at it. I, though, well, in terms of this urgency and, and getting it across, I think my industry, the communication industry, has done an especially bad job, I have to say, and I'm one of them, and I put I'm my hand up as one of those people. I've been mm. in the wildlife business for a long time, mm. and we still have a crisis, so I can't have done a great job um, trying to make amends now. But if you actually look at the way globally the, the media has re reported this, it, it's been so down the food chain as an issue. Mm. And when you actually accurately look at the science and how you're going to report on that science, it just hasn't been given the prominence it needs. And um, if you don't have your big media companies push out the true story of the scale, then how are you going to affect consumers, how are you going to affect business, what have you. So mm. that's the other urgent thing I think needs to happen, is that we, we, we've got a communication crisis and we need to re resolve that. Mm. And we can do that very fast, because that's just behavior. How can we do it? Um, we, we you knock need, on the door of all the bosses no, of the we, biggest... We need to, we, no, we need to bring them to, to, together and how to bring Let them together, them. that is the issue. Well, that's what you have forum like this do, and, and there are also other fora that can happen. But you need to somehow get the, the science information, the accurate science information, in front of media companies so that they realize the importance of this. And mm. scientists also have to play their role because so often they can't agree on what the issue is. And they have to be really, really clear now. We're in an emergency, mm. um, it must be resolved, because the media will only take simple things and part of the dollar. So we have to boil down the issue, simple things, say, that's the story, get it out there, then the rest of it will follow. Mm. So I just think this is why media, business, population, government need to all be joined mm. to solve this it's problem. It's not just the manufacturing industry and other industry, but also the media industry itself. On that point, Nadia, I want to come to you because it seems that you are trying to advocate that the media should do a better job, which many of us would agree. But the question really is about what angle, because over the years you see, particularly with the social media now, people, it tends to spread more emotion rather than information. So I see this film, I also feel a lot of emotions. So what would be the way that work? Mm. Would we spread emotions, which is a beautiful film, or would we spread information for people to analyze themselves
based on the emotions that they already have. So this is really also a way of choices as well. Nadia. I, I, again, I think it is, it is um, I have two things. One, one is about the question that you're, you're asking me and also about CSR. Yes. Um, so uh, about it, whether it's emotion or information, uh, those two, those, those two things are great, but action is even more important, right? So we need to create vehicles uh, where we deliver the information, we uh, create the emotion, and that that then engages somebody to want to take action. Like what kind of emo uh, vehicles? Well, well you, you, we can use social media, we can use uh, uh, donation platforms, we can tie everything together, we can tell a story, for example, Our Planet. So if we aired Our Planet on Netflix, then we work with Netflix who then partners with a giving platform. That giving platform directly links to some organizations who are working on causes that are, have been featured mm. in the series. So we take a multi-prong approach to be able to help resolve and give people, mm. people want to be able to do good, give them the steps and to be able to contribute uh, meaningfully. Now, CSR also, as far as I'm concerned, CSR is a bad word. There is actually no, there should be no such thing as CSR. Business just has to adapt, or it will fail to exist. And CSR just is not. It, it's ticking boxes, mm -hmm. and most of the time, CSR is ticking boxes where the NGOs, the nonprofits, actually don't need those things, mm -hmm. right? And it's not sustainable for the nonprofits or the uh, the the um, uh, the, right. the the, the uh, yeah the nonprofits to be able to operate meaningfully and plan two, three, four year programs. So I just have an idea here that I'm going to throw out. Um, <laughs> how about these big corporations instead of ticking boxes by doing CSR in-house uh, uh, a NGO. So the NGO who sets up their business, sets up their organization to benefit a particular cause, whether it's community, whether it's habitat, whether it's species, they can focus on their outcomes as opposed to having to do their HR legal, uh, uh, biz dev, and all of those things where uh -huh. they don't have skill sets. So the, the organizations in-house them, the organizations can, the NGOs benefit from the skills within the organizations and the benefactors actually get what they need. Mm -hmm. So that's just my uh, two cents on CSR. Mm. We've been having this huge apparatus of both uh, from the companies and industries, from international organization, regional organization, as well as civil society about environmental issues, protection issues, about climate change issues. But still, Keith has to produce this film because it seems that we're still so much lagging behind. Well, you could argue. Without that, we probably could even lag behind even more. But the issue, it seems, it's more about getting things done. I was earlier talking to this Indonesian girl talking about buy-back plastic bags, and the teenagers are telling us, I just don't know why your adults keep on sitting there and talk. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just go out there, go to the street and tell people, don't use plastic bags, use this alternative. I got a cloth bag for you. And that would work. And I think that's a very cute, but certainly a very sharp reminder of what we are doing right here. Not the five of us, but rather what we together, the adults, have been doing right here. So are we really having the issue in our mind? Or this just become one of those topics we want to keep on circling in the talk shops or elsewhere, not really get things done. I hope this could be the platform we got things done. I want to go to you about that. It's not an easy way. Well, so I, I'm not a behavioral scientist, but I, <laughs> I, I do think that behavioral science will tell you that if you want to convince people, uh, pouring an enormous amount of additional data into them is not going to change their mm -hmm. mind. That's why I think what Keith has done is so important. Mm. Um, because I think the entry route into convincing people is actually emotion. Mm. And, um, the downside that has to be carefully managed is the emotion creates room for scientifically not accurate narrative to go out there. Mm. So there is, I don't think you're going to be able to convince, uh, what is it, that we currently have seven and a half billion uh, people with, well, here's the scientific reports, please read that and then come and help us. I actually do think you have to enter into the emotional side of people. Mm. The issue is then you have to be very careful that you don't have too many false narratives popping up. Yeah. Yeah. And false narratives do from time to time pop up, 
Um, and that's where ultimately science comes in, and that's where the business community has a responsibility in these kind of forums right. to keep talking about, well, this is where the scientific consensus is, and this is what we all need to do. Um, I would much rather have a world full of emotion and good intent to do the right thing and 20% false narratives <laughs> than 100% accurate narratives that is adopted by absolutely nobody. Mm -hmm. So I think that Keith has done an enormously valuable thing. Absolutely. That is one tool we have in our hand, which is to tell the real story and tell it vividly so that people really feel it and on a public, on a constant basis, because people forget to when it comes to priorities. But what about the other tools that we still have right now, Dimitri, in our hands? What else do we have? Policy platforms, would they work? For example, COP25, likely to be held in China next year, or later there's the, the Climate Change Summit at the UN. Meanwhile, you have COP25, uh, UNFCCC every year, which always creates huge debate, and it's extended the deadline. So you know everything that I'm talking about. Will these be tools? Uh, absolutely. And will there be one tool will change the complete future? No. Because if that will be the case, then that will be a simplistic modeling of how we're going to solve these issues. I, I, I think, I think that the media and communication industry didn't do such a bad job. I don't need to defend that job. But I think, <laughs> I think it's out there. The fact that we have a COP21 agreement was partly based on emotions on climate change and all these pictures. So it's a wake-up call where I shared the speed, the clock speed, where we need to change. And that will not be one thing. The unfortunate of the situation is that we need maybe 100 things going to happen. Mm. Small initiative on, on the millennials who don't take it. Greta Grunberg who basically steps up. Governments who take the lead. Um, industrial leaders who take the lead, like Cargill and DSM, where we, where we basically agree on renewable energy and science-based targets. Uh, that we get these, these movies, we get Planet Earth 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'm already changing my, my wording because in, in DSM we use the word if we don't adapt ourselves, we will become the dinosaur of the future, right? I will now change that into walrus mm. because the walrus movie is far more emotional impactful than the dinosaur, right? So it needs to be end, end, end. I can tell you, I'm a father of four children. They push me hard yes. on what I do. They say, oh, you work for this Dutch state mine company. So, oh, that was a long time ago. No, no, what are you doing about the future? Mm. It needs to be 100 small things. And a certain moment in time, when all these 100 things come together, in a sort of a flow and synchronicity, hopefully we'll get acceleration on that point, and right. we basically are just in time to turn the tide. But just picking up on what you were saying about the, the COP meetings, we have to make sure that whatever is being asked at mm. those meetings to agree is clear. Yes. And we cannot afford them to fail. And if everyone's got to get that in their head. And the media has to know what must be agreed. And that message needs to be out there so that the politicians have to agree to it. Mm. Because with biodiversity, the story has been time and time again, agreement has slipped through the net and people have found ways out of actually doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. Climate, I think, agree, has been a great success because a clear target was spotted and clear action and clear media campaign right. hit it. But there was all sorts of things. So I, I do, it all boils down to clarity, what needs to happen, and do not let any of these moments fail because mm -hmm. we haven't got time. You already see the energy of this producer when he's having his fist go like this. Yeah. <laughs> We only have two minutes left. We can't go on for one hour with the advice anymore. So if I could ask you, ladies and gentlemen, sitting on the stage, if there's one single picture in this movie that you watched just now, that you think would be the best way for you to communicate with the others about the urgency, and about your idea as to how to change it. What would it be? Keith, I'll save you for the last, no, okay? No. <laughs> so, Dimitri, you want to go first? Right, I already have explained the walrus, so I'll take the opportunity to add another one, and that's the whale, because it's a sign of hope, a sign of optimism, that if we, if we shared 
the responsibility and that we jointly take action, there is hope to recover what the planet Earth was all about. Nadia? Well, I'm, I'm biased. Of course, I'm going to say the orangutan and the bird. Um, <laughs> and, you know, actually, when I watched that, I watched that uh, scene with the bird with my um, family at home, and I was just like, you know, these are the things that we need. We need to remind ourselves just of the incredible beauty that this planet has mm -hmm. and what we stand to lose. So it really is, you know, it's, it's so critical that we immerse ourselves in nature uh, so that we know we could, what we have to protect. All right. Do you still being left with a lot of other choices? I, f I found the walrus hard to watch. So, um, yeah. You don't have to say further. No, so I found that very hard to watch. You sit there and you think, okay. Um, and I found the whales at the end uh, important because I do think that we cannot get things done just by spreading negative emotion onto people. We also have to give people a reason to believe. And things can get solved, mm. and that problem can also get solved. Mm. If you are here sitting the place where I am, you will see this gentleman very firm about his determination. Last but not least, Keith. No, oh, just keep that bird dancing. <laughs> All right. I don't think there is anything I could say as conclusion. Just one phrase only. Our planet, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes.